The sin of Ham should terrify us. Narrated in the Holy Scriptures, it resonates like a thunderous alarm meant to instigate a reverent fear in us. This episode, often referred to as the curse of Ham, invites us to a deep examination of who Ham was and why his curse transcends, echoing with such magnitude through the ages. Allow me to unveil the story. The Word of God introduces us to Ham as one of Noah's offspring, revealing to us that he was the progenitor of Canaan. In Genesis 9.18, we are introduced to Noah's descendants who emerged from the ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, among whom Ham is identified as the patriarch of Canaan. Ham shared lineage with his two brothers, Shem and Japheth, and his father, Noah. Together, they formed the post-Diluvian human remnant, the only survivors of a deluge catastrophe that annihilated all human existence outside the ark. Noah, chosen by God, emerged as a bastion of righteousness in an era tainted by corruption. In a time when the Nephilim marked their descent, Genesis 6, 9 portrays Noah as a man of unmatched righteousness, integrity, and impeccable walk with God, a stark contrast to his depraved generation. It was Noah whom God chose to institute a new beginning on an earth disfigured by sin through the purifying flood. Noah, obeying the divine command, built the ark that would be the refuge for his family and pairs of all living creatures, while the rain sealed the fate of those outside the vessel. Within the privacy of his tent, Ham witnessed a moment of his father's vulnerability and, distorting the value of discretion, chose to disclose Noah's condition to his brothers, instead of covering his nakedness. Perhaps motivated by previous resentments, upon encountering his father in a state of drunkenness, Ham found in this act an opportunity for degradation. The conduct of finding satisfaction in others' missteps, especially those seeking repentance, contradicts the teachings of divine wisdom. Ham failed doubly by exposing his father to ridicule, a failure amplified by the shared mockery. The scripture warns us about the gravity of sin and the folly of mocking it. Proverbs 14, 9 reminds us that while fools make a mock at sin, sin mocks the fools, highlighting that among the righteous there is divine goodwill. The arrogance of glorying in reprehensible attitudes, as pointed out in 1 Corinthians 5, 2 is condemned. For we should instead mourn and seek the purification of the community. Ham's attitude, exposing Noah's faults, not only violated precepts of respect and honor, but also disregarded the magnitude of his father's role as a righteous servant of God. By mentioning Ham as the father of Canaan, the scriptures establish a prophetic link, highlighting the consequences of his actions, not just for himself, but for his offspring. Ham, being a father himself, failed to manifest the due respect and reverence for Noah. In contrast, Shem and Japheth exemplified virtue by covering their father's nakedness without witnessing his vulnerability, a lesson in empathy and mutual respect. This action reflects the principle of treating others' faults with compassion and discretion, covering them with love as instructed in 1 Peter 4, 8, and highlighting the importance of honoring our parents and preserving their dignity. The precept, above all, have fervent and constant love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins, reflects the essence of biblical teaching on the transcendence of love, which, in its purest expression, has the power to overcome human failings. This principle encourages an attitude of forgiveness and understanding rather than judgment and condemnation. Viewing Ham's failure through this lens, we are reminded of the importance of nurturing a generous heart, capable of seeing beyond others' transgressions, promoting healing and redemption. Regarding respect for elders and figures of authority, Holy Scripture instructs us to honor them, avoiding exposing their flaws. 
This teaching aligns with the notion that instead of highlighting others' faults, we should seek ways to strengthen and edify the community around us. Comparing Ham's action with the original sin committed by Eve in the Garden of Eden, we can observe a similarity in the dynamics of temptation and the subsequent seduction into participatory transgression. Both Eve and Ham were seduced by what their eyes desired and both sought to involve others in their errors. Eve persuading Adam and Ham trying his brothers. Considering the limit imposed in the Garden of Eden, especially the dietary mandate, we realize that Eve's act transcended this limit, leading her to consume the forbidden fruit. Similarly, Ham's transgression, though of a different nature, also characterized by crossing an established moral boundary. Noah, upon waking and understanding what had occurred, proceeded with blessings and curses that would shape the destiny of his sons and their future generations. His decision not to curse Ham directly, but rather Canaan, reveals a complexity in the consequences of human acts and the associated divine reprimands. The prophecy pronounced by Noah about the future of his sons, especially the curse directed at Canaan, resonates with the weight of a destiny that would unfold over the centuries. The curse that Canaan would be a servant of servants sets forth a prediction of subjugation and humiliation that would find its realization in Israel's victories over the Canaanites, thus fulfilling Noah's prophetic word. This moment of prophecy highlights the divine sovereignty that permeates human history, where today's actions echo into the realities of tomorrow. Therefore, the episode of Ham and the subsequent curse on Canaan teaches us about the repercussions of our actions and the importance of living according to the principles of love, respect, and discernment. At the same time, it reminds us of the divine mercy and justice that manifest through generations, shaping destinies according to divine designs. Judges 1.33 presents a fascinating episode in the history of Israel, illustrating the complexity of the relationships between the Israelites and the Canaanite peoples in the Promised Land. This verse tells us that the warriors of Naphtali failed to drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath. Instead, they chose to cohabit with the Canaanites, who, over time, became forced laborers under Israelite dominion. This passage provides rich ground for reflection on the intergenerational dynamics of sin and the consequences of human actions within the broader context of divine providence and redemptive history. The principle that the sins of the fathers can affect their descendants is a recurring theme in the scriptures, serving as a solemn reminder of the moral and spiritual responsibility we hold in our own lives and the influence we exert over future generations. The story of Ham and the subsequent curse cast upon Canaan is emblematic of this dynamic, where we see not only the immediate consequences of disrespect and dishonor, but also how these actions reverberate over time, affecting subsequent generations. This concept teaches us that the legacy of our actions extends beyond the immediate, permeating the fabric of our families, communities, and even nations. Likewise, the episode in Judges highlights the tense coexistence between Israelites and Canaanites, reflecting the complex reality of occupying the Promised Land, where complete obedience to divine commands of expulsion was not always followed, leading to compromises and unintended consequences. Reflecting on not envying sinners, even in apparent prosperity, is another crucial aspect of this narrative, it's a reminder that divine justice, although it may seem delayed in human eyes, is infallible and will manifest in due time. Material prosperity or temporary power are not indicative of divine blessing or righteousness. Rather, they are often allowed by God as a way to test hearts and refine characters until the cycle of iniquity reaches its limit and justice prevails. 
The blessing conferred upon Shem and Japheth, in contrast to the curse on Canaan, further illustrates the principle that both blessings and curses have expansive reach, transcending the individual to affect entire communities over ages. Just as curses may endure until a cycle of iniquity is broken, blessings also flow through generations, offering hope and the promise of redemption. This understanding emphasizes the importance of living righteously and obediently before God, aware of the lasting impact of our choices. Thus, the narrative of Judges 133, along with the story of Ham and his descendants, offers us valuable lessons on responsibility, spiritual inheritance, and divine sovereignty in human history, reminding us of the importance of seeking righteousness and living according to divine precepts, aware that our actions today will echo into future generations. The concept of generational curses and the power of words are themes that deeply penetrate the fabric of the biblical narrative offering a vast field for reflection on the nature of transgression and its repercussions across generations. The phenomenon of generational curses points to a reality where the actions and words of one generation can create echoes that reverberate through time, affecting descendants often removed from the original circumstances of the act or spoken word, in the biblical context, Noah's curse on Canaan rather than on Ham illustrates the depth and complexity of the consequences of our actions and words. This event is not just a historical account, but also an opportunity for reflection on ethics, respect, and honor within family and community relationships. The specificity of the curse directed not at the immediate perpetrator but at his offspring, highlights the biblical understanding that the consequences of sin and dishonor can extend beyond the individual, affecting those who, in human eyes, may seem innocent or not directly involved. The power of words, as taught in the scriptures, is a recurring theme that permeates both blessings and curses, Words have the capacity to build or destroy, to bless or curse. Proverbs 11, 9, by highlighting how the wicked can destroy their neighbor with words, while the righteous find deliverance in knowledge and discernment, reminds us of the intrinsic responsibility of our speech. Thus, the biblical narrative calls us to an exercise of discernment and wisdom in our use of words, conscious of their potential for lasting impact. The issue of Ham's disrespect and the subsequent curse on Canaan opens space for multiple interpretations, reflecting on the deep meaning of uncovering nakedness and the implications of such an act. This act and the varied interpretations of its gravity emphasize the importance of honoring the dignity and integrity of others, especially within the family context. The shame associated with nakedness introduced by the original sin in the Garden of Eden establishes a paradigm for understanding nakedness and exposure within the Judeo-Christian tradition, associating them with issues of intimacy, privacy, and vulnerability. The legacy of generational curses and the role of words in shaping blessings and curses in the Bible challenge us to consider how our actions and words can transcend our time, affecting future generations. We are thus called to ethical and moral responsibility, to use our speech and actions in ways that honor God and promote the well-being and dignity of others, recognizing that redemption and restoration are also part of the divine plan for humanity. The phrase uncovering nakedness, frequently used in the scriptures, carries with it a deep and multifaceted meaning closely linked to notions of immorality, lasciviousness, and disrespect. This term interpreted in contemporary Bible translations as a metaphor for illicit sexual relations underscores the seriousness of transgressing the bounds of intimacy and honor within family and social relations. Leviticus 18.17, for example, vehemently condemns the act of unveiling the intimacy of close relatives, 
categorizing such acts as depravity. Similarly, Deuteronomy 22.30 underscores the respect due to a father by prohibiting a man from engaging with his father's wife, considering such action a direct violation of paternal honor. This theme of honor and respect is echoed in the teachings of Jesus, who elevates the notion of love and respect for others to a universal principle. Transcending differences and conflicts, Jesus exhorts us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, illustrating God's unconditional love, which blesses the righteous and unrighteous alike with the gifts of creation, like the sun and rain. Matthew 5.45 This teaching reinforces the moral obligation to treat all people with love and respect, recognizing that our actions have repercussions beyond our immediate circle, potentially affecting future generations. The story of Ham and the subsequent curse placed on Canaan by Noah highlights the lasting consequences of sin and disrespect. However, the scriptures also offer us a message of redemption and hope, as seen in John 1.12, which promises to all who receive Christ the power to become children of God. This verse signals the overcoming of the curse of sin and the possibility of spiritual restoration and renewal. The account of Noah, who falls into sin after having been an instrument of salvation during the flood, serves as a powerful reminder of our vulnerability and the need for constant vigilance. Even those who have stood out for their righteousness and obedience to God can fall into temptation and error. This aspect of Noah's story underlines the complex nature of the human condition, where even the righteous are not immune to faults, and the importance of remaining vigilant and humble acknowledging our constant dependence on divine grace and support. Thus, the biblical narrative on the exposure of nakedness, Jesus' teachings on love and respect, and the episode of Noah's failure invite us to deep reflection on human dignity, moral responsibility, and the possibility of redemption. They are reminders that, amidst our flaws and vulnerabilities, we are called to pursue justice, love and mercy, leaning on the divine promise of restoration and sonship to God. The biblical teachings are filled with wise guidance and stern warnings about the dangers of excess, especially regarding the consumption of alcoholic beverages. The Holy Scriptures, from the times of ancient patriarchs to the apostles, emphasize the importance of vigilance and temperance in all spheres of life. Luke 21.34 serves as a beacon guiding Christ's followers through the stormy seas of temptation and excess. This verse calls us to constant vigilance and prayer, preparing us for the day when we will have to present ourselves before the Son of Man. Just as a sailor watches the horizon to avoid shipwrecks, Christians are urged to stay alert, to not be swallowed by the waves of worldly excesses. Noah's story after the flood offers us a penetrating insight into the dangers of drunkenness. His fall into a state of nudity and vulnerability mirrors the story of Adam, who after his transgression became aware of his own nakedness and felt the sharp sting of shame. However, whereas Adam attempted to hide, Noah lay exposed, devoid of any attempt to cover his shame, a silent testimony to the inability to judge clearly under the influence of wine. This narrative not only sheds light on the physical consequences of drunkenness, but also highlights the loss of dignity and the exposure of internal vulnerabilities that can follow substance abuse. The prophet Habakkuk, with words of fire, condemns those who lead others to the brink of ruin through drunkenness, a warning that resonates through the centuries reminding us that the consequences of such acts go far beyond mere personal shame, touching on divine wrath. This echoes a recurring theme in the Bible, where alcohol consumption is not forbidden, but drunkenness is firmly discouraged. Ecclesiastes 9.7, for example, reminds us of the joy of celebrating life with a content heart, 
but always within the bounds of moderation. Ephesians 5.18 warns us against drunkenness, not just for the evil itself, but for what it represents. A surrender to the spirit of this world instead of being filled with the Holy Spirit. This verse calls us to seek a fullness that transcends temporal satisfaction, encouraging a life guided by the Spirit. In direct contrast to the disorder and chaos that excessive alcohol brings. The writings of Solomon in Proverbs 23, 29, 35 paint a vivid picture of the woes that follow the abuse of alcoholic beverages, from emotional distress to physical disputes and health deterioration. These words not only highlight the negative consequences on the individual's life, but also serve as a warning about the long-reaching effects that excessive alcohol consumption can have on interpersonal relationships and the community as a whole. Christian freedom, as discussed in 1 Corinthians 6.12, is framed within the limits of personal responsibility and fraternal love. The Apostle Paul reminds us that although all things are lawful for us, not all things are beneficial or contribute to our spiritual well-being or that of others. The true exercise of Christian freedom involves choosing a path that not only honors God, but also builds up and strengthens the faith community. The Bible guides us to live a life marked by vigilance, temperance, and fraternal love, avoiding the excesses that can lead to spiritual, physical, and moral ruin. By following these principles, we can aspire to an existence that reflects the glory of God and promotes peace and well-being in our community and our own lives. The Epistle of One, Corinthians 8. 9. 13 presents us with a principle deeply rooted in Christian conscience. The responsibility we have towards the weaker in faith. Paul warns that our freedom in Christ should not become a stumbling block to brothers and sisters who may be less mature in the faith or whose consciences are still fragile. This passage reminds us of the interconnectedness of the faith community and the importance of exercising our freedom in a way that builds up and does not destroy. The story of Noah and Ham, deeply woven into the tapestry of Genesis, reflects not just a question of individual morality, but also the complex interactions within the family nucleus. Ham's action in exposing his father's vulnerability was not just a violation of Noah's privacy and dignity, but also an act of disrespect that broke the bonds of honor that should prevail in the parent-child relationship. This narrative highlights the dynamics of sin and grace within family relations, demonstrating how the actions of one individual can deeply affect those around them. Noah's reaction to his son's actions prompts us to consider the responsibilities of fatherhood. Being the most righteous man of his time did not exempt him from the complexities and challenges inherent in parenthood. The story suggests that personal righteousness and justice do not automatically guarantee success in raising children. This insight makes us reflect on the nature of parental influence and how values and teachings are transmitted and sometimes distorted across generations. This biblical passage broadens our understanding that love, while essential, is not the only necessary component in child rearing. There must also be a conscious transmission of values, boundaries and expectations. Thus, the narrative of Noah and Ham serves as a reminder of the need for a balanced approach that incorporates discipline, guidance, and above all, a life example that children can aspire to follow. Biblical stories of families, often marked by conflict and challenges, offer not just a mirror to our own family struggles, but also a source of comfort and guidance. They teach us that family dysfunction is not a modern phenomenon, but a human reality that spans centuries. Through these narratives, we are reminded that perfection is not the goal. Instead, the continuous pursuit of wisdom, grace, and love within the family 
is what draws us closer to the image of God. The divine instruction recorded in Deuteronomy 6, 7, 9 sets a fundamental milestone in spiritual pedagogy, not just for the ancient Israelites, but for all subsequent generations. This text is not merely a suggestion, it's a robust commandment, an ordinance that transcends time and space, intended to integrate God's precepts inextricably into the daily fabric of family life. Impress them on your children is not just an invitation to sporadic education, but a call to constant immersion in divine truths, ensuring every moment is an opportunity to reflect on God's wisdom. This ongoing instruction should occur when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, a poetic formulation that encompasses the entirety of human existence. Every action, every moment of rest and activity is seen as sacred, a chance to testify about God's glory and commandments. This holistic approach to religious teaching reflects the understanding that faith is not confined to temples or synagogues, but permeates every aspect of life. Just as the heavenly manna fed the Israelites in the desert, God's words should be gathered and consumed daily, nourishing the soul and directing the steps. The text goes further, instructing the faithful to tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. This symbolic imperative highlights the need to keep divine teachings in constant focus, guiding not just actions symbolized by the hand, but also thoughts and intentions symbolized by the area between the eyes. The act of writing these commandments on the door frames of your house and on your gates serves as a physical and spiritual reminder of God's presence and authority over each home, a safeguard against forgetting and neglecting His laws. The advice from Proverbs 19.18 Discipline your child, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting them to death, echoes the delicate balance between correction and care. Discipline, seen here not as punishment, but as loving guidance, is rooted in the hope for a righteous and pious future for the child. This verse underscores the importance of measure and discernment in parenting, reminding parents that their goal is not to break the child's spirit but to mold it according to divine wisdom. Colossians 3, 21 and Ephesians 6. 4 offer a necessary counterpoint to discipline, emphasizing the importance of encouragement and love. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged, is a call for parental sensitivity, recognizing children's emotional and spiritual needs. These texts acknowledge parental authority, but insist it be exercised in a way that fosters children's trust, inner strength and faith, not their desolation or resentment. Proverbs 22, 6. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it, encapsulates the biblical view of education as a long-term investment in the child's soul. This wise aphorism suggests that early formation in faith and morality sets an internal compass that will guide the individual throughout life, even amid the numerous temptations and challenges the world presents. Through these passages, the Bible articulates a vision of parenthood that is both a privilege and a sacred responsibility. Teaching, disciplining, and loving are acts imbued with eternal significance, conducted under God's guidance. In this divinely ordained endeavor, parents are called to be both educators and living examples of the faith they profess, guiding their children not just with words, but through the tangible testimony of their lives. Human nature is such that temptation presents a constant throughout our lives, regardless of age or spiritual maturity achieved. Noah's story, even after being chosen by God for a task of monumental importance, 
reminds us of this perennial vulnerability to sin. His failure, occurring in a moment of carelessness, highlights the biblical message that vigilance and prayer are indispensable at every life stage. Like Noah, we are continually called to seek closeness with the Lord, cultivating a relationship that strengthens our faith and protects us from the snares of sin. Humanity's trajectory in the Old Testament is marked by repeated deviations from God's established path, illustrating an apparently endless cycle of fall and redemption. From Adam's fall, through the promises made to Abraham, to the Israelites' liberation from Egypt and the establishment of a nation under divine laws, we see a series of divine interventions aimed at redirecting the people to the path of righteousness. However, persistence in sin highlighted the need for a definitive solution that would transcend the established sacrifices and rituals. Jesus Christ emerges in this context as the supreme fulfillment of divine promises, the final answer to the dilemma of human sin. His incarnation, sinless life, and sacrificial death represent the apex of divine intervention in human history. Through Jesus, not just a model of purity and obedience is offered, but a means by which humanity can be reconciled with God. Isaiah 53, written centuries before Christ's coming, foretells in astonishing detail the Messiah's suffering and the purpose of his death, highlighting the providential nature of God's plan for salvation. The crucifixion of Jesus was not merely an act of martyrdom, it was the fulfillment of a divinely orchestrated exchange where he took upon himself the consequences of human sin, allowing divine justice to be satisfied without compromising God's love and mercy. This exchange not only liberates the believer from the bonds of sin, but also imputes to them the righteousness of Christ, enabling a restored relationship with God. This doctrine of penal substitution so central to the gospel, underscores the depth of God's love for humanity. By taking the penalty for our sins, Jesus offers us the possibility of a new life, marked not by the weight of guilt, but by the freedom of grace. The cross, therefore, does not only symbolize sacrifice, it is the emblem of victory over sin and death, the turning point where God's justice and love meet. In response to this unparalleled gift, we are called to live a life that reflects gratitude and commitment to divine precepts, aware that our salvation was purchased at a tremendous price. The Christian journey, therefore, is one of constant vigilance, prayer, and transformation, driven by the assurance that, in Christ, we are more than conquerors over the temptations and challenges we face. This divine exchange, deeply rooted in scripture, reveals God's unconditional love and his perfect justice, a justice that demanded payment for sin, but whose love provided the supreme sacrifice to redeem humanity. God's grace, therefore, emerges as the central pillar of this grand plan of salvation, accessible to us solely by faith. First, it's essential to understand that Jesus was punished so we could be forgiven. This exchange is the foundation of the new covenant prophesied in Jeremiah 31, 34, where God promises no longer to remember our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, as Isaiah 53, 5 reveals, showing that through Christ's sufferings, we have access to divine forgiveness, a gift we don't deserve and could never achieve on our own. Second, Jesus was wounded so we could be healed. Christ's wounds, symbolizing the depth of his pain and suffering, became the source of our healing, both spiritual and physical. Peter, reflecting on Isaiah, reiterates in 1 Peter 2.24 that, by his wounds, we have been healed highlighting the totality of redemption that includes our health and well-being. Third, Jesus was made sin with our sinfulness so that we could be made righteous with his righteousness. 
This truth, outlined in 2 Corinthians 5.21, illustrates the perfect substitution. Our iniquity was placed on Jesus so that in exchange we could receive his spotless righteousness, not by our merits, but by his grace. Fourth, Jesus died our death so we could share his life. Jesus' death on the cross was a literal fulfillment of Ezekiel 18.20, which states that the soul who sins shall die. However, Christ, being sinless, chose to die in our place, offering us eternal life in his resurrection, as promised in John 11, 25, 26. Fifth, Jesus became poor with our poverty, so that we could become rich with his riches, in 2 Corinthians 8. Nine, we see that for love, Jesus embraced human poverty, allowing us to access the riches of his grace a spiritual inheritance that surpasses any earthly treasure. Sixth, Jesus bore our shame so we could share his glory. Hebrews 12, two tells us of Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. His willingness to face ultimate humiliation made possible our adoption as sons and daughters of God, co-heirs of his eternal glory. Seventh. Jesus endured our rejection so that we could receive his acceptance as children of God. Isaiah 53, 3 depicts the Messiah as despised and rejected, a man of sorrows. This rejection he faced secures our place in God's family, accepted and loved eternally. Lastly, Jesus became a curse so that we could receive the blessing. Galatians 3.13 states that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. This radical exchange frees us from the bonds of sin and death, paving the way for us to live under the blessings of the new covenant. In prayer, we approach God with grateful hearts, humbled by the magnitude of his sacrifice and the immeasurable love offered to us freely. We ask for wisdom to live according to his word, strength to resist temptations, and eyes to see the wonders of his creation. May we be lights in this world, reflecting the love and mercy of Christ, living not for ourselves, but for him who died and was raised for us. If this content was valuable to you, I ask for your support with your subscription, so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. Together, we can enlighten more minds and expand our understanding. Thank you for being here, and may God bless you.